Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Professional Service Group of Mercer County this morning. And of course, happy Aloha Friday, as I always like to welcome people with my Hawaiian shirt, and you are always welcome to wear something floral or have a floral background in Eileen's case, works out nicely. PSG of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody that is in any kind of career transition. And so uh, as a career transition, we do have lots of resources for you. And so one that we do have is our LinkedIn group. So I encourage you to go on to LinkedIn and look for our LinkedIn group. It is called PSG of Mercer County. It's a little bit of a private group. It's public in the sense that you can find it. But when you request to join, we vet everyone that does request to join because we do want to make sure that whoever is in our LinkedIn group has been to at least one of our in-person or virtual groups. We're just trying to keep people that collect groups for the purposes only of themselves, name collectors, list collectors, group collectors, have nothing against people that are sales oriented at all, but just want to um, make sure that these are people that kind of understand and get or are interested in truly helping job seekers. We have now over 1,700 members in our link group. LinkedIn group. A lot of the members are active and they contribute posts and articles and job leads and other information like that. So thank you for those of you that have contributed. If you're not yet a member of our LinkedIn group, uh, I do encourage you to go find it in LinkedIn and click the join button and we will accept you very quickly into our group so you can participate as well. In addition, we do have our website. Our website is psgofmercercounty.org psgofmercercounty.org. It is more than just a landing page. It is over 120 pages of content. So there's a lot of information there. And in addition, it does link to lots of other resources that we offer. Uh, like I mentioned, we do have our YouTube channel with over 90 videos uh, since we've been um, uh, virtual. We are now having started, I can't believe this, our third year of being virtual. So you can, and by the way, when you're in our YouTube channel, on the channel, like on all YouTube channels, there's a little um, follow us or um, uh, subscribe button. So click the subscribe button because you'll get notified uh, for different information as we post. We do post on YouTube almost every week. In addition, uh, we do have a menu along the top of our website. One of the menu items is called professional development. So you can press the professional development menu item and you get a list of choices. One of them is e-learning. So we have a link to our e-learning page and we've had the e-learning page there for a few years, but we've added a few more e-learning websites. We now have links to 84 e-learning websites on our e-learning page. So it is a pretty robust resource. Now, not all of those e-learning sites are free. A lot of them are. Uh, some of them do ask for a subscription or some of them will have just pay for that one class or, or certification that you're interested in, but at least it's one-stop shopping to find all those different e-learning resources right there. So go take a look at it. You may find some that will be helpful to you. And of course, Oh, sorry about that noise. If you are indeed um, in a, a job search and you get that question, what have you been doing since you've been uh, last working? Of course, something that you could say is, well, I've been job searching. Well, of course, that's a very realistic and true answer. But um, a better answer is I've been taking classes. So that could be a stronger answer than just I've been in a job search for the last X number of months. So you may be able to uh, look for some online learning classes to improve your skills. In just a moment, uh, Eileen will share her screen, and so she has a bit of a hybrid presentation in this hybrid model, and so what that's going to be is she may flip back and forth between the slide deck and, and uh, communicating with us and in, engaging with us. This should be a very fun and engaging presentation, as typically her programs are, and so just uh, come along for the ride. And uh, so, but what I will ask is that you do keep your microphones on mute. Uh, until she requests that you unmute them if she wants to, or if you have a question, uh, what you can do is one of two ways. You can put in the chat uh, the word question, and that's the digital equivalent of raising your hand. And if you're not familiar with chat, chat is in the upper right-hand corner. It's a little uh, circular icon. There's my flashcard for it. So in the upper right corner is a circular icon. You click on that and then a little chat window opens and you can write a message. And I encourage you, write it to everyone, not just to Eileen or not just to me. 
because this way uh, multiple people can see it, including both Eileen and I at the same time, potentially. And so then uh, I will simply say, oh, excuse me, Eileen, there's a question. Or um, in, in addition, you could write your question, but type the word question followed by the question, because that allows the questions to stand out from other comments, makes it a little bit easier for me to pick them up, so I don't want to miss them. And so that is how we will do that. You'll use chat, unless, of course, there's a specific time that Eileen engages us directly. So that is our ground rules. So with that, I'm happy to say that PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome, welcome back uh, Eileen and Sinet. Eileen has provided coaching services to support uh, speaker confidence, message clarity, and audience connection for more than three decades. Her company, Speaking That Connects, serves diverse professionals from a variety of industries to positively impacting their presentations, networking introductions, interviews, and digital presence. Eileen blends her foundational skills in the communication arts and sciences with her experience in career counseling, presentation training, English as a second language, and the performing arts to facilitate client success. She has a master's degree in speech improvement from Kane University and a Bachelor of Science degree in Speech Pathology and Communication Sciences from Emerson College in Boston. PSG of Mercer County is always pleased to welcome coach and trainer Eileen Ensign. Oh, wow. There it is. Thank you so much, David. So um, two things. One, Dave, um, David, the, on my Mac, it's not a circle chat icon. It's a square. So oh. people might want to know that. Um, it's a new Mac, so maybe it's in the new, um, it's new. Uh, the other thing is I'm going to spend a good amount of time without the slides because I don't think slides are the most important part of this. I think you are the most important part of this, but you will get the slides afterwards as a PDF and I will have you engaged <clears throat> towards the middle with slides. But right now I need to and want to focus on you and these last two and a half years. I can't believe it's we're entering the third year of the pandemic. When it happened, I thought I'd be out of work because my work is in-person work. And lo and behold, working from home, working through digital platforms, I still have a business of coaching people's interviews, presence on Zoom or whatever platform, and uh, serving their skill sets. So uh, lots of different types of clients, some corporate, some nonprofit, some professionals, uh, usually new opportunities. Like I've never spoken to a group of a thousand before on stage only in the boardroom or in the conference room, or um, I'm making a video and I want to know how my pronunciation is or how my image comes across. These kinds of things are very present in my practice. But as I said, this is not only about me, this is about you. And since the pandemic, so part one of this presentation is my survey, and it's not a formal survey, so I do want you to share with me. Um, the question has to do with the question I was asked by a reporter recently, and if you got US1, you'll see an article on this particular subject, profiling PSG and me as a speaker, focused on introductions. And since the pandemic, my curiosity is, have you been in online meetings that have had any formality or process of introducing yourself? Because I know from the past, doing many PSG groups, different ones, Central New Jersey, Mercer County, Hamilton, that uh, there was a process either 15 seconds, 30 seconds, stand up and come to the front, introduce yourself, name, rank, serial number, basically tagline, location, what you're looking for. It was pretty much a bulleted suggestion of how to introduce oneself. So I have not been in that 
formality since the pandemic, but I'm wondering if others have had situations that they can share in terms of introducing oneself. Um, John, at, hi. Uh, at CIT, um, we have a formal process uh, that we go through uh, every meeting. Um, timing, um, something about ourselves, um, done alphabetically uh, by first name, um, you know, um, every meeting. So John, uh, what I heard was that these meetings are going on since the pandemic. Yes. And everyone gets a chance to introduce themselves. This uh, is not- forced to. <laughs> they're forced to right and it's through a, a platform like this some kind of yeah, platform it is zoom it's zoom and you get a certain amount of time yes and we are timed by uh, one of our the leadership council waving her hand you know you're too long uh point is to get some discipline to it at least as to the duration so, John, may I ask you, how many people attend this meeting? Uh, 30, 40. So, 40 people are giving Carol. How long are you allowing? Fewer than 15 seconds. I time it on my tablet. So okay. Who's, okay. So, 30 people times 15 seconds. How much time is that? Somebody be the mathematician for me. Usually about 20 minutes. So 20 minutes of listening to introductions of people all related to the IT field. Um, no. Oh, no, not okay. IT. Everybody, all Everybody. industry, all levels, all disciplines. Okay, thank you very much. So that has persisted through the pandemic, that structure. The difference being that you don't have to stand up. People don't know whether you're tall or short. Yes. They just get to see you from the head to the shoulders, basically. Thank you, John. Anybody else have an experience of formal introduction process since the pandemic? Because my observation has been in the few meetings that I've attended that it's been abled. For, for example, like if there are 40 people here, sometimes when it was live, we had 100 people, 15 seconds, that takes up a lot of time, right? Now, the meetings that I have attended have been um, using chat to answer a question. So we're not really introducing ourselves, but we are sharing. So it might be... Um, what have you learned most since the pandemic? And you might have 30 people sharing with a facilitator, then calling it out. Not Hi, so Yes. Uh, this is Bill Pagula. I um, had an experience with um, watching actually a, a corporate educational session. It was kind of a multi-day thing where they, they tried to do a virtual conference and I think they succeeded but every speaker seemed to be following an outline. Um, and because every introduction was followed the same steps. And uh, I didn't write them down or anything, but one thing I did notice is people were introducing themselves and they were, and this might be a 2022 thing, but they were also, explicitly saying how they identify. I'm male, I'm, uh, and, and so on. The, uh, so I thought that was interesting. And the fact that they were following a formula uh, shows that uh, the, corporate, the corporation that was putting it on was paying attention. Okay, so it sounds like the content of this conference, corporate, meeting might have had something to do with diversity mm -hmm. so that well, was also the speakers were i would say 
uh, 35 and younger. And the company itself is very young. So that might have something to do with a diversity focus as well. It was actually an IT conference. Okay. But. So thank you, Bill. I really appreciate that. Um, so you said it seemed to be formulaic in some way, follow its structure. And my, my experience of being in front of a group that is like PSG is that most people will follow the person's structure before them. If you say your name and your company and where you're located and your tagline, someone else might do similarly, not everybody. And for me, uh, quite honestly, I am going to come very clean here. I find it tedious to listen to 30 people following the same structure because I don't get to know them. I do not feel them. It's hard to do that in person and I think harder, unless I'm taking notes, to do it um, through a platform like this. So I'm just curious, am I the only one who gets bored easily from listening to the, what I'm gonna be pejorative is the name rank serial number style of formality of introduction. I, if you think it's it could be better or you don't like it, could you just do something like this? All right, so at least half of the people feel it could be more interesting. Um, when I'm on Zoom or another platform, I take in the person's face mostly even though I also see their background, I also see whether they smile or not. Now, just because you're in, just because you smile doesn't make you better than someone who doesn't smile. But these little blocks are artificially representing who you are. And so I'm not here to talk about background so much um, or how you present yourself on Zoom or a platform, but it does count. And when you're being interviewed, I would think that that's something that impacts many people unconsciously. So if you're in the lower, you know, part of the screen, um, people do that. Sometimes you're looking up their noses. Um, Sometimes the backgrounds are over overwhelming. Some people have a, a, a photo or a painting behind them, but it looks like it's coming out of their heads. I think these are things to uh, check, not that it has to be perfect, but that you are putting your best self forward. Now you said this, uh, Eileen, I thought you were gonna talk about creative introductions. The first thing people see, if it's not in person, is this little box. And you're in it with whatever else is in it. So there's your first impression. Oh, excuse me, Eileen. So there's a, a comment or question, I should say, from uh, James Degnan, uh, right about that same thing. He has a, a question or comment about first impression. So James, if you wish to ask, uh, just unmute yourself and please uh, do so. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now, yep. Hi, my name's James, and my voice is my business card. I do voiceover and voice acting now, having retired from IT for about 32 years in that business. And the first thing I was thinking about, when we began to do online Zooming, I don't have a built-in camera to my uh, desktop, PC, and since I specialize in voice, to me, audio is more important. And I noticed today a lot of people don't have any picture or video. Um, and I'm just wondering what Eileen thought, and maybe David, how important it is to A, have any picture uh, or a video? Is it considered impolite not to have a video or a picture? And how does this affect people's first impression of you? Well, I can only thank you, James. And of course, I know your voice. So um, 
I think it, it depends. I think it depends. Is this a group of people that you know? This is a first time meeting. For me as a presenter who is people oriented, who's worked in person 40 years in my profession, I like seeing people. And when I run, I run a group Wednesdays, an English second language uh, freebie through the public library uh, in Plainsboro. And I get 20 people on a screen. And if some of them are just their names, I never get to know them. I call on them, but I never get to really know them. Think about being hired by a company and never being seen. I mean, it's, it's actually a potential happening now with some work from home, but it is, uh, for me, a preference. I don't say it's a, it's better or worse. For me as a presenter, it's a preference, James, to see the people if I have the possibility of seeing them. Well, I would agree, and, and I, was, I was wondering if, for instance, today I would like to post my picture, but I have never used GoToMeeting from my home. I've used Zoom a lot, and my picture, still picture, will appear, and I just have to learn how to get an account to uh, use GoToMeeting in the future where I can put a picture up there. That may be true of a lot of people today. So I agree to be seen at least a still picture. I would want to see the same thing, especially in a formal meeting. Uh, as as you would want to if you want to hire somebody. The plus minus to me of a video is worrying about your background. Do you use a virtual background and all some problems it may have? And how much does it uh, upset somebody who may be wanting to hire you or not, not to see a video? I can't talk about being a hiring manager and the reality, but I can tell you as a consultant, I have done a group for a company where some had their cameras on and some have their cameras off. And just because of who I am and I am a social people person, I would favor the people who are present visually. Now, I can't say that's going to be true for everybody, but think about how you made friends you know, it's not only through pen pal writing way back when, you know, you meet people in a physical space, you share proximity, which we are sort of doing in a very partial way on screen. Uh, we are a name and a face and we're in a room. But if you go into an in-person space, you realize that you you're not seeing a, you will only see a person and you will note what their size shape facial expression gestures colors friendliness are all about and this is um you're not seeing in a live situation a person without a face and just a name I guess my quick follow-up would be, you would prefer, prefer a live video as opposed to a still picture? If it's a small enough group, yes. If it's a hundred or more people, it's not gonna matter because the space of seeing is so minimal. But picture definitely is better than a name for me. Right. Thank so you. what about the rest of us? James, thanks. I like the pivot here. How about let's hear from other people what they feel? Most of our meetings are screens on, i.e. we want to see the videos. Um, basically because as you were saying, it's not in person, but it's the next best thing. Next to that, it's a um, still picture of the person because it still gives a, a reference to the name. And even though one of the meetings that I'm on Thursday nights, we have about 500 people on the call. It's a Zoom call. And again, it still helps to have a picture. Thank you, Carol. 
Anybody else want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I, I would say it really depends on the size of the meeting. In particular, smaller meetings, it's easier to be more intimate and get to know people and see them. If it's a very large meeting, that's more difficult. And it, I think it depends on whether the meeting is going to be interactive or it's just like a webinar where somebody's doing the presentation. So I think it's really a matter of where where it goes on that continuum. Thank you. So um, familiarity, size, those are some of the influences. Anybody else have something to say about? I made, I made a comment in the chat, uh, if you would, wouldn't mind commenting on it. 75% of people get their information with their eyes, 20% with their ears, and 5% are tactile. Um, since three quarters of people view and remember their world through their eyes, this is why you should have your picture and look great on the screen. And I um, am in the same court with you, Alex. So yes, we get most of our information through our eyes. I once was asked by a colleague, well, what if you're blind? How do you present then? You know, or because I was talking about eye contact being so important. That's a different, uh, that's a different discussion. But I think Alex has a great point. It's pretty simple. As a human, we get most of our information through what we see. Sometimes that triggers judgment in a bad way, but if you are vigilant about how you present yourself, then do something that promotes you in a visual way. Because let's face it, before you say anything, people are sizing you up. Not necessarily negative. Oh, he's pretty tall. Oh, she changed her hair color. Oh, David wears a Hawaiian shirt. Oh, that person never smiled the whole time they were in, in my company. That was a wimpy hair. Uh, that's even before touch. So just facial expression, gestures, clothing, um, size, shape, complexion, jewelry. These are the things that pop before anybody says anything. So my, 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 it's not about how beautiful, how thin, because we know people who are, say, marketing media perfect, who may still be not friendly and not authentic in terms of interactions. I think the first thing that you need to do is show up with an intention of being present and warm and learning and connecting. And that energy, which we can't touch in a room like this, in a platform room like this, you do feel when you're in person. You can be just the listener in a group and be really memorable because of the way you attended and by the energy you put out. Not verbal, not clothing, not image. So I think the most important piece comes from the inside out and it happens immediately. So whatever you started with today when you got on the screen is a first impression before you said anything. Did I handle it enough, Alex? Okay, so visual is how our brains process the more than other ways. Not everybody's will be 75%. It might be 80% for some of you and 60% for others of you, but it's still the highest number. All right, so let me, let's back up. I started with a survey to find out what have people been doing in terms of introductions. And I did hear from John that that meeting that he tends to, that Carol is involved in, gives people 15 seconds to describe themselves. My meetings, I usually ask a question. Some people raise their hand, some people put it in chat. Meetings I've attended, it's been a chat versus a um, verbal because of the size of the group. I'll give you an example. I may not know you very well, but I could say, David, 
I'm going to call on you first. Here's the question. What made you smile this morning? Um, <laughs> you know, seeing your face in the morning, because you're always very pleasant. And, you know, we got on nice and early today. So I think I had that was one of my first smiles of the morning. Okay. It doesn't have to be my smile, but what made you, Nancy, smile this morning? I and mean, you smile a lot. I always smile. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a good day. I went to, went to a, I guess, a concert or whatever last night, and I had a good time, and it's Friday. Oh, it's sunny out now. Look at that. So a reflection on last night, the, the weather, the sun. How about you, Shannon? Uh, walking outside with my morning coffee and seeing the blooms on a Pyrrhus japonicus uh, telling me that spring was really here. Okay, you're going outside, seeing the blooms. John Samson. Yes. What made me smile this morning? Um, yeah. Let me think. I went outside to get the newspapers, we still do that, and my neighbor across the way waved. I waved back and he yelled uh, about a dinner invitation, saying, okay, this is somebody I like to have, them, we like to have dinner with, and uh, oh, by the way, uh, long overdue. Okay, see how sharply and, and concisely, even in the moment, you can call up an experience, say something. I now know a lot more about you than a name, rank, and serial number. Now, I know this is not uh, a question that produces information about you in transition or about your business, but we want to pull that energy into introductions that just who you are personality and then we can look at language and character and, and specifics is there someone who wants to volunteer to answer that question because i don't want to play favorites here but i also don't want to put this on to everyone um what made you smile today if you want I'll to answer, please charlotte ann um my dog the sunshine and a phone call from a friend. Okay. That is that who was speaking? Charlotte Ann Iwasco. Do I not see you? All right. I have my camera off. Thank you. Okay, because I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking. It's a little disorienting for me, but it's okay. It, that's your choice. Thank you. Hi, Lynn. Um, can I make a small contribution here? You know, I've been married for many, many years to my wife and every so often she says in the morning, Alex, I don't understand you. You just step out of bed and you have a smile on your face. How do you do it? And I say, I don't know. This is not something that I want. It's natural. So our smile is a reaction to our brains functioning in a certain way. Evidently, I'm happy in the morning now. What happens at night when I'm tired? I smile less or I don't, or I frown because whatever. So smile is something we do because our brain makes us as a circumstance to the environment or what's happening. Yes, I understand that behavior and the neurology and, and the psychology behind it, but that's really not where I'm going with this. I, I wanna demonstrate that one question that's a human question can be a kickoff for a meeting and you can get in less than five seconds, a little snapshot, not a visual one, but a narrative snapshot of a personality. And you can find, you can, you can resonate with that person more likely to resonate with that person because of what they're sharing. Oh, I'm a speech consultant for 35 years. I have a background in speech pathology and I uh, have a business that works with corporations and nonprofit organizations to promote speech 
com speaker confidence, message clarity, and audience connection in leaders worldwide. That's a nice written statement, but I don't know that you get me. So what I'm suggesting is there are ways to allow your personalities to come through where the language doesn't over constrict you. Yunsik, you are smiling and I wonder what you're thinking. I always smile. <laughs> I don't know why I should not smile. That's not true. You weren't smiling when you first came on to this. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, well, um, I'm usually smiling. Yeah. Can you tell me? Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself. Well, after you've done that, I don't know if I have a good way of introducing myself. What, what kind of are you in transition? I'm in transition. Yeah, I worked at educational testing service uh, for 15 years. Um, um, I'm in, in current transition for two months. Um, I'm still figuring out what I want to do. I, I don't want to go back to what I used to do. So, um, um, yeah, I'm trying to see like uh, what my options are. So, okay, I may come back to you in a little bit. Thank you for sharing. Sometimes it, you need to pull sharing out of people. All right, I did the survey bit. I and what I'm coming out with is most online organizations have not been doing what used to be called elevator pitches, although some, as John shared, Carol shared, have continued to have a structure. Now, I wanna tell you a little bit about my journey, my background, and it's gonna lead into introductions that have to do with interviews. And Alex is here and Alan are here. This is not the only way, this is one way that I was taught. So please um, weigh in if you like, but first my journey. So as I mentioned before, through the pandemic, I thought I was gonna be retired, forced into retirement because I didn't know anything about digital platforms and I truthfully wasn't open to digital platforms. I'm an in-person personality who likes to train, who likes to speak, who likes to coach. So I thought I was dead in the waters, so to speak. And um, it's not the truth. You can work from home and you can adapt and develop and be successful. When I first, that, so that's about the pandemic. That's my journey around the pandemic. Not to mention that I didn't dye my hair anymore, so my, my headshot needs to be changed. All right, so the second part I wanted to talk about is networking my journey. I remember my first networking on in-person meeting, and it was over 30 years ago. And it was the Institute of Management Consultants. And it was held at the Forrestal Doral, which is now the Marriott, um, so it was local. And I was probably the third of three females in a group of 50 males. I was in my 30s. Most of the people were suited in suits and were in their 60s. I did not have gray silver hair then. They, all, they mostly did. And so I felt really not so comfortable in a physical way. And then the structure was like a breakfast or a lunch. So there were round tables and each table, I'm sure you've done this in a chamber meeting or another meeting, each table, uh, each person at each table was asked to stand up and introduce themselves. I had never done this before. I didn't know what an elevator speech was. I never heard of networking. My mind was thinking a net, I, I, you know, like a hair net. I don't know, a net, what's networking? So this was my first introduction. And I remember, as I bet many of you may have had a similar experience, 
watching people pop up, as I say, introduce themselves. And while they're talking, I'm thinking, what am I going to say? So what am I going to say? And that means I'm not listening very much to the person who's speaking, which is hard to do both at the same time. And then by the time it was my turn, I had my palpitations going on about being self-introduction and it wasn't comfortable. Now, after 30 years, I finally got to a point of figuring out what I want to say. It kind of reminds me when I did my first business card. Am I calling myself a speech therapist, a speech pathologist, a communication specialist? Um, am I choosing this font? Am I going to make it this point size? It, there is a lot of choice in image and language. And if you aren't, say, the most say, uh, natural, spontaneous word, cert, word maker, word crafter, you may also feel compromised. How many people, after they give an introduction, and maybe it goes back and it's not current, go, I wish I, I, wish I had said that, or I left something out, or that wasn't my best. Yunsik's laughing because I think she's had that experience. It's like, why didn't I say that? Well, it does require some, I think for most people, it requires some effort, some practice, some kind of thinking through how do you want to introduce yourself? And there are many, many ways, but we seem to get locked into one. Sometimes we get locked into it because we are educated to have a tagline and every time we get up, it's the same structure, but it doesn't have to be that way. And as I said in the beginning, I guess I get bored easily with the same structure when I hear 30 people introduce themselves. So that's my background in networking, background in pandemic, and now my last piece of journey had to do with career counseling. So after I started my business, after being downsized, I couldn't find a job I liked. So I said, I'll be my own boss. I didn't know anything about business, but I guess I trusted myself or felt my purpose strong enough. And I opened an office with no hardly any money. I was broke in a year. But anyway, I got my first consulting opportunity with a career counseling mom and pop business. How did I get that? Well, back in the early 80s, my field of speech was not supposed, it, it was considered questionable to advertise. And then it was newspaper class, uh, what do you call those ads? It was an ad. And um, someone saw my ad, had a company, had a need, knew my last name and wondered if I was related to someone they knew. And that's how I got into that part of my business. Francis J. Need, I don't know if he's still alive or if he's uh, practicing, but he was part of the background of, uh, or worked with bowls and what color is your parachute or uh, my parachute. And um, he can, had me working with the video portion of his counseling senior executives on their re-entry. So after he was finished, I came in, I put the camera on, I heard the presentation, interview presentation, and I gave feedback. Sometimes it was feedback on posture, sometimes on clothing, sometimes on messaging, sometimes on eye contact, sometimes on length of conversation or specifics. That's what I do. His method, which I have used and I tweak, has to do with this. And I suggest that you might think about this after the meeting. Three adjectives that describe yourself. What kind of person are you? 
There's zillions of adjectives. Which three are you going to pick? And of course, you want to align them with whatever job, because you have more than three ways of describing yourself. So you're looking at the job opportunity and the adjectives, right? So you could be a, a manager who has a lot of the same, two managers, same skills, different personalities, right? So who are you? Three adjectives. What are you good at? Now I'm a speech coach. I'm good at a lot of things that relate to speech, but there's some things that I wouldn't prefer to do. I'm not someone who has a lot of experience with hard of hearing or deafness. I don't do sign language. Some of my colleagues do. That would not be something I would promote. Accent, really good with that. Managing people's English second language, absolutely. Their stage presentations, absolutely. So what are the three things that relate to this job? What are the three skill sets that you are strongest in, that you want to be remembered by? So I'm a this, this, and this kind of person who's good at this, this, and this. And the third area is the proof, the narrative, for example. When I was working at such and such, I increased blah, 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 I reduced, I promoted, I mentored a Romanian woman who missed the deadline for her bachelor's education at Rutgers and told her, submit it anyway, beyond the deadline. If they need the money, they are gonna say, and you have the, 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 the right grades and fit, they'll take you in, and they did. And then she went on for a master's and now she has a PhD and she's um, written two books. But she was an immigrant who didn't know the system. And so she was thinking, you know, I missed the deadline. Okay, I have to wait a whole year. I might tell that story to say, I'm supportive. You know, I'm, I don't know what another word, tenacious. You know, I, so vigilant, but you have to come up with your own ways of thinking about yourself. This might take some time. It doesn't, you know, you might say, well, I'm friendly, I'm creative and I'm perceptive. That could be all true, but maybe there is another way of looking at yourself. So that's my journey in terms of introductions with careers. Now, these are not networking introductions. This is tell me about yourself. And Francis J. Need's way of coaching his senior outplaced executives was this method. Now, I might tweak it and say, I'm really good at this, this, and this and I'm this kind of personality, I might reverse it. That might be my coaching input, but basically it's the who you are and what you do that is going to sell you to that job and some proof behind it. Plus the authenticity of your personality showing up. Oh, excuse me, Eileen, there is a question from uh, Pat Monahan. So Pat, you want to unmute? Go ahead. Eileen, you've used the uh, the phrase tagline several times in, in, in different contexts. Uh, are you using the word tagline the same way advertisers use it? Is that how you're using the tagline so that you say something during your introduction or, or your elevator pitch that's unique and not, not boring uh, and routine? Okay, I'm not quite sure, but Patrick, I would say taglines, as I understand them, are pretty um, anchored messages that brand your business. My tagline is I promote speaker confidence, message clarity, and audience connection in leaders worldwide and it's printed. Um, it's not a right or wrong. 
it, but it's it's something that's a brand. It's a it's a content piece that you anchor as part of your company or your your professional business. Okay. Well, the the only reason I ask is because uh, early on when you were mentioning people giving it, you know, elevator pitches and they get routine. Uh, David, when we were live, actually solved that problem because you had five seconds to uh, to give your elevator pitch. And the reason I speak about tagline is because in my five second or maybe six or seven second uh, pitch, I would use the phrase, uh, I bring two particular talents to the position. One, I'm an excellent hand holder and two, I can herd cats. Now, the the that last sentence uh, almost always brought a, a few chuckles, uh, but it was something that was not the same as everybody else speaking. And that's what I meant by, that's what I understood as the tagline. I was wondering if you were using that same type of definition. Okay. It is, it is, yeah. If you use it over and over again, um, it could get, uh, it can do two things. It could either be positive, you know, I won't say just two things. Yes, I'm thinking of that kind of sentence that comes from you that is unique. But it could be less creative. It could be we're the best IT company in Mercer County. Or we create chocolate chip cookies without gluten. Or we're gluten free. It, I mean, it's something that you anchor as part of your brand. And it's usually, uh, I thought of taglines in marketing as part, it's printed, you know, like uh, never leave home without it or just do it. That's those kinds of um, ideas, which become oral after they're written. Does that answer your question, Patrick? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. Thank okay. you. Okay, and like James Degnan had said and, and also chatted, his voice is his business card. That's his tagline. He's a voice actor. He does voice work. Okay, so I wanted to give you a little bit of the background. Pandemic, I thought I was dead. Uh, networking, scared, shitless. I know it's recorded, I don't care. Um, you know, the first time I hadn't prepared, I just felt new, it wasn't comfortable and interviewing my experience with um, Francis J. Need and this idea of planning who you are by, by adjectives, three adjectives, your skill sets, three, and at least two accomplishments or achievements that tell the story. Because at some point there's gonna be a follow-up question. Oh, you can do this? Give me an example. Tell me what you can do. So those are things to have prepared, not memorized, but prepared. Okay, I think you can be comfortable and memorable. I think you can be comfortable and not memorable. I've seen it. You can be uncomfortable and not memorable. And you can be uncomfortable and memorable. So it, it I don't know where you fit there and maybe need nothing, but I also want to say there are formal and informal situations. And now after, after this little bit, we're going to see the, the uh, PowerPoint. If you get tired of just listening and, and watching. So think about meeting either a significant other or a best friend that became a best friend. That, this is the informal. This is not name, rank, serial number, creative, tagline, or six seconds, or structure. This is informal. What happened first? How did you meet? How did you, what happened? How did you get to know this person? Anybody? I bet you were in the same space, physical space, a bar, a party, a classroom, 
a networking event, a wedding. There was proximity. I think something, remote, what's that? Something common, like uh, my friends lately through my daughter's like parents' friend, friends. So something that we share common. Something in common, right. An experience in common, an op a situation that you were both uh, familiar with. So there's some kind of proximity. I I'm thinking when I met a close friend, I saw them in a space. And there was something that said, I want to get to know them. Or I'm curious about that person. Uh, yeah, David, thank you. So one of my best friends or longtime friends, my wife and I, <clears throat> is my former dental hygienist. So I had nowhere to run while she was talking with me, keeping me relaxed while she was doing her job. But we had a lot in common and, you know, we talked about families and we said, hey, maybe we should go out to dinner. And we've been friends for 20 years. Well, talk about proximity. You know, here in you the are. Same space. She was literally in my same space. Yeah. <laughs> was in your space. In your in my face, space. In my face, too. Yeah. In but, your face. Yeah, nice, very nice people. Yeah. We're very, very pleased. So you might have liked her demeanor, her weight, not her clothing, because probably wearing dental clothes, but her style, her friendliness, her way of speaking, tone of her voice pace of her language. It wasn't like uh, love at first sight. You know, there was a relationship developing. Now someone else, because dental and literally her being in his mouth, I don't know. Um, <laughs> someone else? With sharp instruments. With sharp instruments. Yes, you were a victim. But she was not threatening at all. Very nice people. Very nice lady. Mm -hmm. Shannon. I so I first met my husband when I walked in as a um, very low level person from an organization at a meeting he was chairing as the founder and executive um, and neither of us were very impressed with each other. And then our second meeting was uh, under a chuppah at his boss's wedding to my boss um, and then seated at the reception table, things took off. And what did you notice about this person, your husband? Uh, it, that we shared a lot of commitments to justice issues and that kind of uh, work and uh, family. And even though we came from different faith traditions, faith traditions are important. Okay. All right. So I, I'm going to kind of summarize my point of view here that it's usually proximity or something in common that brings people together. And then as David and Shannon are sharing, there's interaction. There's questions and responses. It's that simple. I remember being uh, on a, the big chamber train ride. I think it's Walk to Washington, it was called. And, and, and people, business people were on a train ride and they were landing at this um, hotel. And it was huge. It was like 5,000 people. On the train, you're, seen, you're seated with four people in a you know area on the train much easier for me to have a conversation in that smaller space than walking into a ballroom by myself not knowing anybody seeing clusters of groups talking we probably know each other from work or another situation and meeting someone having that introduction the way I would handle that now not being as uncomfortable is to enter to, to see who who would I like to meet? Who looks interesting to me? Walk over to the group and listen. Be on the periphery for a moment until they ask you in. And that way you don't say much at the front end, but you're not alone. So what I'm saying is the size of the space, the structure of a space, tables versus lines of seating versus a big ballroom 
where everyone has a cocktail. Uh, it, th there are different levels of comfort for different people. And sometimes just like meeting someone in a bar or meeting someone at a chuppah, you can be proximal and not say anything, but be present, authentic, and have the intention of meeting someone. And that's a first step. Because at some point, someone's going to say, oh, tell me about you. It's sometimes it's less formal. Oh, this is my first time here. Maybe you want to ask the question when someone gives you an opportunity to talk like, is this the, have you been here before? Is this the first event of this kind that you've ever attended? You ask the first question. No, 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 this is, I've been coming to this thing for five years. It's very likely they're gonna return a question. What about you? It's a dialogue. It doesn't have to be a total structured tagline, perfected introduction in the informal situation. That's my point. But later, as you get to know each other, it could become, well, tell me about yourself. And it could become a little more formal. So there's exercises that I'm going to present now that I hope will support the creativity and the breadth of possibilities um, that are there for you in terms of self-introductions. Of course, the context matters. Informal, formal, structured, unstructured, large room, small room, seated, standing, lots and lots of nuance. So let me see if I get this up and going. Yeah, great. That's step one. Let me move this to the side and, ah, oh, all right. You see the screen? Yes, we do. Thank you. All right. All right, let's find out what you noticed. The last time you were networking, you don't have to write it in the chat. You can speak it out or, or if you can write it in the chat. What did you notice? And David, I can't see that stuff. Well, maybe I can. Let's I'm see. sorry, you can't see. No, 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 no. I'm going to the chat. Okay. I, no one Nothing can... there just yet. Okay. <clears throat> I'll tell you, I was at a networking event before the pandemic, and I noticed a really attractive woman sitting behind me in this. I mean, she just was a knockout. That's what I noticed. I didn't go to meet her. We were seated and listening to a presentation, but as I looked around the room, I thought, wow. She could be an actress. So image was something that attracted me. I was at an in-person meeting after being in the pandemic for the first time live. And I was, in, I was surprised by the height of some of my colleagues. Could not ever know that that person, that woman, was six foot two from a Zoom screen. So there and, are a couple of comments. Great. That, yeah, Anna has said, I noticed not too many people smile. Okay. And Nancy commented, groups of people chatting within their groups. Okay. So you notice groups of people chatting and also people not smiling. So we, we basically, anybody else? We're talking about what you notice first. And obviously I'm one of those visual people. I noticed the gender. I noticed this style of the person. Person. Yep, so there's a few more comments. Uh, Jan mm -hmm. Suk, only a few people talking. So that's what she noticed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Greg 
you need to always be ready for the possibility of a job discussion situation. Okay. And Donald has uh, observed groups of people that had known each other for a long time and others that were new or alone. Got it. People who know. Also, those... James? Eileen James. Yeah, I noticed for the first time being on GoToMeeting that I didn't know how to put my picture up, which I wanted to do, and a lot of other people didn't have their pictures up, and I agree that having a picture up would be helpful. So next time I do a go-to meeting, I have to figure that out. There you go. So to, thank you, James. So to Alex's point, I, I, I focus on what I see. And I bet most of you too. I'm not sure handshake should be in that category. I think that's an error. But certainly you see size, gender, race, culture, ethnicity, clothing, jewelry, things of hats, Hawaiian shirts. But other people, let's see, here we go. Uh, might notice, and I bet um, James might be one of those. Well, what do you hear? You know, so maybe you don't at all pay attention to height and weight and ethnicity and gender, but you you hear the person's voice or you hear their style of talking. Most of us have a combination of this. And then I think this is underplayed a lot. I think what when you walk into a room of people you don't know and you finally kind of find your comfort zone within your own body, what do you sense about people that whether you're speaking to them or not speaking to them, do they look like they're friendly? Do you sense that they might be an honest person or authentic? Or do they feel, do, do you sense they're showy or they're not, sincere. These things go on really quickly, like 30 seconds. And so what can you do? And I kind of intimated this when I talked about the big ballroom situation. You can listen and you can ask questions and you can share. Those are the informal ways of introducing yourself. They take many more runs. They take many it takes longer, but it's over time. It's not the structured six seconds. This is relationship building. That's really how you get to know each other over time. All right. I have a question, Eileen. Yes. I, I have found in walking into a room with a lot of people, I, I have found it easy to walk up to someone who's standing alone because they may be as nervous or as uncomfortable as you are. And more often than not, they're, all you have to do is say hello, break the ice and the conversation starts. Patrick, I'm so glad you said that because that's exactly my truth as well. When I was so uncomfortable and shy, I'd look for the person who was as equally isolated. And because I'm a helper, that made me comfortable. I could go up to that person and say, hello. And that is, you, you saw the person, you were in the space of that person, and then you took the next step and you came closer and opened your mouth and said, hello. And then the rest becomes dialogue. I, I've, all, I've also found it curious that once I've done that and <clears throat> myself and this other person having a conversation, and we're sort of relaxed at that point, other people will just come and join us. I'm sorry. Because so, they, they feel, we're, they see we're comfortable and they, they kind of stroll on by. Exactly. It is no longer the 1980s where I think some coaches directed us to go to the meetings and collect as many business cards as you can. First of all, people, don't always have business cards nowadays. You're taking pictures or giving out numbers on your phone. Um, so it's not the more the merrier. It's really the comfort level, authenticity, and I think sincerity. So I think what Patrick's saying is um, you, 
you saw a way to make yourself comfortable and someone else comfortable and then the rest just kind of flowed and people notice or felt the energy of comfort or dialogue and they joined so i think that's a great contribution and that's the informal style of introducing think of being at a bar in college it's not name rank and serial number right away it's looking at a person smiling saying hello, asking a question, sharing something, back and forth, not monopolizing. Let, let's go on. So I'm sure you know that, I think you would know that you can be memorable positively or negatively. So can someone share how they, how someone they knew they remembered, but in a negative way? Oh, I've got a comment, um, sort of more. It, it's dealing with the um, previous screen and a comment you had made earlier um, about blind people and like not being able to see things in a room. Um, I had an uncle who was blind, and surprisingly, when you lose one sense, and in his case, it was sight your other senses take over. Um, and for him as well, it was uh, hearing. Now, he could tell things like height, uh, gender, uh, some cases race, race ethnicity. Um, if, if you put out your hand and shook his hand, he would be able to tell that, uh, as well as the other things under hearing. Um, and really looking at that list, um, pretty much everything on there, you know, outside of physical sight. And uh, it was kind of amazing to me. And there was a time when he went to a concert, a rock concert with uh, his kids. And afterwards he said, the music was so loud that it messed him up for a week and he was walking into things. Now this this was a, a man who, when you walked into the room, if you were shorter, he would look down toward you. If you're off to his side, he would know to look to that side. So it, it's um, it's interesting when you walk into a room and stuff, and, and for someone like him, you probably wouldn't think of it as as much, you know, because of a loss of sight. Um, but it, it it really, for me, brought forward how just because you lose one thing doesn't mean you can't make up for that in other ways. Don, Donald, thank you. Yeah. That, that's, that was a great story to share. And the bottom line is that I think senses are connected or complement each other or can accommodate for a loss and and you can still be very present even with you know a weakness or um in a sense so thank you did i capture that enough yeah for me yes okay so i'm, I'm going to ask you Yes. Now, this is Greg. If, um, I was just getting ready to respond to the question. I think it was about like a negative situation. That's where we're going now. Yes. Yeah. So I, like, I had one um, where it was interesting. Someone um, had recommended that I kind of network and possibly create a mentor mentee relationship with uh, someone that was a higher level of me. I'm my employer, and it was kind of interesting because after two or three lunch sessions, it, it, it turned into more of like, like it, about that person and not about me. It wasn't like even a 50-50. I would say it was like an 80-20, um, and I was on the 20% side, and it just left me with this feeling of like, Oh my God! You know, you're at a senior level, and and you're going to use this almost like as a PR session, as as opposed to 
trying to, you know, help me possibly, you know, point me in some new directions, give me some um, guidance. And maybe, maybe I misinterpreted. Maybe that was his way of by explaining his career and how he got there. That uh, that somehow I was supposed to just take that and and say, oh, okay, you know, thanks, as opposed to uh, being, you know, I was looking for something a little more proactive, but knowing that I had to do the work. But uh, you know, so that was that left me with uh, kind of a negative taste in my mouth. So, so uh, Greg, so the bottom line is people who don't share uh, equally or balanced, it's, when the conversation is not balanced and one person does more of the talking and the other, too much more of the talking and not enough of the listening or not enough listening to give you an opportunity to share, um, that can leave a negative impression. That person is about himself or isn't a good communicator, or didn't allow me to contribute enough. And it's your perception, right or wrong, that left you with a negative perception that was memorable. I remember that guy, he didn't give me a chance to say much. So that's one. I remember looking for an apartment and the landlord was a strong, heavy smoker. And I remember the lingering nicotine breath and had no interest in really going any further. Um, it, it was a disconnect for me. So smell, someone else could see, I, let me ask somebody else besides uh, me and, and Greg, something negative that's memorable in your experience. All right, no one, uh, well, let's go on. So on the positive side, we like maybe a, a firm handshake or feeling that it's the right handshake, but we're on Zoom, so we can't handshake. Strong listening attention, which Greg is, uh, has alluded to. Sometimes we will remember someone because of their Hawaiian shirt or a hat or a pin. I have seen people wear pins whether they're lapel male pins or female pins and they have a theme like golf or music and that's an instant recall and trigger for conversation oh we play golf i see oh you're a member of the masons oh you um do you go to see a lot of concerts i like your pin it has a saxophone in it etc now as far as things that turn people off, here's some of them. Someone who's very loud, like the music, I think, um, for Don's story. Uh, that's a turn off. It actually upset this person's equilibrium. Some people are very sensitive to handshakes. I am. So if you give me a dead fish, it, it lingers as that person doesn't have a good handshake doesn't mean they're a bad person. Someone who half listens, have you ever gone to a meeting and you start a conversation with someone and then all of a sudden you notice the person you're talking to is looking above your head and is kind of distracted by someone else who walked in the room? You can't see that on a Zoom screen, but you have seen that in person. Sometimes inappropriate clothing. You know, if you dressed the way you would for a I don't know what they call a club, a disco, uh, for a interest interview. Your skirt might be too short. Might your your pants might have too many rips in them. All those uh, styles are not appropriate, um, and it could even be clothing that doesn't fit you well. You know, a, a, you lost a lot of weight, and you're wearing a jacket when you were that you wore when you were 300 pounds and now you're 200 pounds, that might linger in my memory. I wish you would get a jacket that fit. I would be easier for me to get to know that person. And as I mentioned, cigarette smell could be too much perfume. Did you ever meet someone who had way too much perfume for you? Sometimes that lingers as a memory. I remember her, she was the one with that awful, intense perfume. And then if someone is just rude, 
you will remember those things too. There are probably a dozen other, if not more, things that people might recall that they're just not ready to talk about here. So here's your first exercise. And if you have a paper and pencil near you, this or pen or a computer, um, you might want to do it now. If not, do it later because you'll have the PDF. I get clients referred to me sometimes because they talk too long. They're not succinct enough. They don't get to the point. They're leaders, but their promotability is in question because they just don't have the succinctness of the leader desired. So you want to come up with six words or less that start with a verb, a phrase that's six words or less starting with a verb, i.e. for me, I support speaker confidence, I develop speaker's presence, I deliver motivational speaker speeches, I design presentation training, I edit documents and PowerPoint decks, I promote presentation excellence, I inspire audiences to take action. These are things I've thought about. It's a good exercise. You probably won't say all of these in an elevator pitch or a six second introduction, but perhaps one or two or three are valuable to you. And in the interview process where I asked for three skill sets, you might select from this six words or less. When you know these phrases, they become second nature, but not wrote, owned in your body, in your heart, you can say these things. It's not the first time you're saying them, but they're not memorized. So we, this is a dig deep and come up with six, well, how, what do we have here? Seven, as many as you want, but six words max, starting with a verb. The verb carries the action. So is there a volunteer that, I know this is going quickly, that wants to share one, two, or three of their choices about them it's a way of introducing yourself hi i'm so and so i'm really good at these three things da 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 anybody shannon sure um let's see i uh I write materials and facilitate small groups and launch new initiatives to engage congregations and communities in social justice um, activities. So you gave me those three in one sentence. Okay. Can you do it verbally in the phrase form? Sure. So if I, I say to you, Shannon, what do you do? I write um, books and other materials uh, on engagement in social justice. I facilitate retreats and other small uh, groups. And I create and launch new initiatives to engage congregations and communities in advocacy. So I like the second one better because I can retain it better, but you also broke the rule of six words or less. So I would coach you to be more succinct because it'll give your interviewer an opportunity to say, tell me more. People's listening attention is not good, not in America. We are bored quickly or we tune out. And it wasn't that you were boring, but it was like a lot of words. For you, they make a lot of sense. I remember social justice, I remember writing, and then I wanna remember these three things. So that's the reason to do it in this way. You can augment it over time, but get the core. I do this, I do this, I do this. And then I'm gonna say, well, about writing, what kind of writing? About social justice, what kind of events? Okay, thank you for volunteering, I appreciate it. Anybody else want to do it? Okay. 
I don't see anybody. I'm moving forward. All right. What are the benefits of what you do and why? So a little bit of Shannon's, now there's an extension. I simplify complex material to help my clients learn to present, learn their presentations. I eliminate mistakes so clients promote their best image. I enhance style in order for my client to be memorable, etc. This is more than six words. It's another exercise. But notice they start with verbs. What do you do? What are the benefits? Start with verbs. I'm not asking you to do anything with this. It takes a little more time. Now, I told you before that I get bored easily in terms of listening to multiple 15 seconds of introductions. So I would like to suggest different ways that you could start. And I know if you've been in any of my in-person presentations, you've seen something very similar to this. So instead of, hi, I'm Eileen Sinet, and I'm a speech coach, and I promote speaking confidence, message clarity, and audience connection and leaders worldwide, I could start with any of these. More than anything, I want my clients to succeed in their communications. I'm Eileen Sinet. I promote blah, 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 blah. Okay. What keeps me awake at night is knowing that I've given the tools to clients, but they didn't use them. And therefore they didn't get the job. Can you think of a time where you felt shaky about speaking to a new audience? That's pretty normal, but it's still uncomfortable. To get some mileage on speaking to new audiences, contact me, Eileen Sinet, speech coach, blah, 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 speaking that connects. See, I these are in the moment. I did not memorize these. Imagine introducing someone whose name you can't pronounce. Not everyone had the same education in terms of phonics. Some of my clients are terrified to make these kinds of introductions. That's one of the skill sets of Speaking That Connects, Eileen Sinet. Anybody want to take a stab at their, what they do using one of these? It's a different exercise than six word only verb starts. This is another way to start. Do I have a volunteer? And, it, and these are not the only, what I call starter phrases that you can choose. You can choose anything. I'm trying to get people to get out of the habit of, hi, my name is, my business is, I work to do this. It's too linear for me. Um, so these are possibilities. All right. Uh, nobody's volunteering. We're moving to, is there a volunteer? Okay. I would, but I don't want to dominate. <clears throat> sure. No, you're, you're here to learn and you're practicing. Go ahead. Go for okay. it. I would say, um, Imagine knowing that, you know, millions of children in the United States are facing various crises and that your faith calls you to do something about it, but not knowing how to connect the two in action. So my work is writing materials and creating initiatives that help people put their faith into action to solve the problems you know are out there. There you go. How did that feel? Good. I never would have thought to 
I love those little sentence start. I mean, it's, I would never have thought to start that way. And it is so much more interesting than the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of the group, but for me, it made me pay attention longer. And I know that your focus is you, that you have these ideas, but they're not connecting to, you know, you have this population, you have an idea, but you don't have the connectors in place. So I, I got more out of that myself. And yes, I've heard you say a little bit about it, so maybe it's a little bit biased, but I think in general, people have told me this helps them. And some people will take the start differently, this exercise, and they'll play with the other exercise of six verbs, or not six verbs, verb starters and benefit reasons. And they'll come up with a very concise way of sharing about what they do that sounds authentic and creative and they're then memorable. Thank you, Shannon. So moving on, I'm just giving you some examples. Colleagues say they learn more about their communication strengths and weaknesses in two hours with me than they have learned in their whole career. And then I have like kind of like a tagline for interviewing, presenting, and networking. I'm etc. Imagine driving into a lake, only having the experience of swimming in a pool. People speak all the time, but they don't make formal speeches every day. So this is more narrative, but it's and it's story-like, but it starts with a creative opening or a starter phrase. There's another um, game kind of exercise I've come up with, which is, who are you when you're not doing your job? So I'm a tap dancing speech coach with a foundation in communication sciences. So what? That means I embrace precision and performance while taking in physical, behavioral, and cultural nuance. Now, I, I, I didn't make this up in one moment. As I was preparing this, words come maybe a little more easily to me than others, but maybe you're a golfer, maybe you're a, a jazz enthusiast who's in IT. Does anybody want to share something? Then I'll continue. So I, mean, you know, I, I have another question that really relates to two slides slides back. Uh, I used to have a, a friend of mine and he conduct interviews, interviewing people. Yes. And as you mentioned where you said, uh, you know, show six things that you do and add, he would ask this very simple question. He would say to the interviewee, give me three words that describe you. And he said, he was amazed at some of the things he would hear or maybe more amazed at some of the things he wouldn't hear, meaning they couldn't describe themselves. I always thought that was a, a, a very interesting question. And I think that people should think about that as well, not only as it relates directly to the business, the things that you were, were showing, which are absolutely important, but if someone asked you, describe yourself. In other words, nothing to do with business or the job. Yeah, I, I gave you that example when I was talking about introductions, the first three characteristics about yourself. It doesn't have to be that you're going for a job interview, but that was the template. Oh, okay. Who are you? Three adjectives. I think that's a really worthwhile exercise. And even on resumes, I see it. Three, so you, I'm a this, this, and this kind of person with these skills. And then you have the experience and background. So um, Pat, thank you um, for reinforcing that. I'm gonna go to where I left off, which is my latest um, play with pitch prompts. Um, I had to work on this. Uh, maybe you can use some symbolism with animals. Um, so I thought of different kinds of lawyers and I came up with this one. Now, you don't wanna use what I used. I came up with one last night. It's like, 
I don't look like an elephant, I hope, but I have tough skin. I've been told I have really tough skin. So, and then whatever that occupation would be and your name, you would add. So I think you can, you, words are so flexible that you can come up with um, ideas that are creative. Here's another one with an animal. Do you want a puppy or a full-grown German Shepherd to represent your case? That's basically talking about experience, right? So as your legal support, I'm strong, solid, and most importantly, protective of your assets. It is creative. It may not be for everybody. That's why I have so many choices here. Um, someone shared a piece of this with me in terms of a workshop exercise. You know, are you more like a like a icebreaker? Are you more like a storm door or a bay window? And I decided you could actually use this to introduce yourself. You start with the narrative. Recently, I was asked, is your work more like a storm door or a bay window? I was kind of surprised by that. Well, my coaching is transparent and I pride myself on seeing the light and supporting client goals from several angles. So I guess I'm more like a bay window, et cetera. Okay, and lastly, I think this is lastly, it's the narrative. You say what is true. For me as a consultant, I'm gonna talk about clients because if I'm networking, I'm interested in you knowing what kinds of clients I serve. And my clients can be entrepreneurs, they can be executives, they can be professionals. They often say, I'm nervous about speaking publicly, or I don't like my voice, or everyone says they can't hear me in a meeting, or my boss says I get too long to get to, take too long to get to the point. I have shared some of these examples. And here's my bottom line. I am a specialist in figuring out strategies and solutions for turning these problems around. And there's my tagline again. It's as longer, it depends on how much time you have. But if you were in a conversation with a couple people in a ballroom, um, you this after some turn taking of finding out a little bit about each other in a very natural way, you could say, well, I have clients who are afraid to speak from stage. I have clients whose bosses tell them they can't hear them on conference calls. You may not do all of them. So these are samples of people who I help. I'm a specialist in communications. I just, you know, took it apart a little bit. So I'm going to sum it up. You don't have to do any of these creative ideas if you don't want to or if they don't work for you. But if some of them trigger interest, then you will. But if you do these without authenticity and kindness and presence as a human being, I don't think the words will stick or be memorable in a positive way. So. Just like Alex said, you know, we see people, or 75% of what we see is what we're focused on. Um, we also, before we're even seeing sense, truth, lie, um, fear, comfort. And so you have to show up in the best self you have to be in your own skin and to be as comfortable as you can for yourself first. So that means acknowledging insecurity and inexperience to yourself, your shyness, whatever, making sure you don't beat yourself up in your brain. Oh, I'm really, I really suck at this. I hate these kinds of things because that doesn't help. mothering or supporting coaching yourself to say i can be resilient i can learn i will be more self-compassionate 
And then once you go from the inside out, you want to also, which is an inside skill, listen to others, then ask a question to bring them out as Pat had shared, you know, going to the shy person and share something about yourself. If you're in person, you'll want to be giving good eye contact. And if you're with a camera um, or with a, a computer, you'll want to be looking at the camera. And my bottom line is try something new. I'm not going to say what you do is right or wrong. I get bored easily. I like creativity. And I know that many people have taken some of these suggestions and written me and said, I'm happier now and I landed it and I'm really satisfied with how I talk about myself. And I wish that for all of you. So thank you for participating. This is me before pa the pandemic. I will get a new headshot, I promise. Um, this is my journey and I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you. And I will any, any last minute uh, questions, folks, before we officially wrap up? And we're going to keep the session open after we turn off the recording in just a minute. We're just hanging around the meeting room. By the way, Eileen, I don't know if you realize that you have a headshot with both uh, your current hairstyle and a hat. It's on your LinkedIn profile. I know. And <laughs> my advisors and the US One newspaper person decided to use an older headshot and I basically was I put it there yes I put my LinkedIn hat informal shot up and it's okay with me yep yep eventually, eventually I'll get the 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 business jacket and the you know formal headshot thank you David well Eileen thank you so much and you know this wasn't just an informative presentation you gave us action items things that we could take away and work on on ourselves by ourselves so rather than just giving us information you gave us a means to take take this presentation kind of with us uh, once I guess it, it actually is over and ends. We've got things we can do and make improvements. So thank you so much. I think presentations become so much more valuable for all of us when we have a little bit of uh, potential homework to do to make improvements. And James Degnan just asked a question about whether the PDF would be going out automatically or how is it accessed? So, um, just as we are wrapping up, when you were publishing or talking on your last slide, I published on our website. All of our documentation that's provided by our presenters is on our website. On every page of the website, on the right side, upper right side, uh, is a link called Meeting Presentation Documents. And for people like Eileen who have Macs, it's also called Meeting Presentation Documents. For some reason, Eileen's Mac does things differently. So that's what you do. And when you click on that, the web page will open. And this uh, is the first uh, set of information. So we'll have a link there. Uh, later today, or maybe tomorrow morning, we will have our YouTube video. On the right side of our website is a link to our YouTube channel, uh, and that will be available uh, as well. But um, yeah, I uh, need you know, a few minutes for um, GoToMeeting to finish its processing, and then I will cut out the uh, 30 seconds or so it took her to find her cam or re her power supply, and uh, no one will ever know except us. <laughs> And so uh, letting you know uh, what else we're doing and coming up over the next few weeks. Um, so Lynn Williams will be here. Our guardian angel, Lynn Williams, will be talking about what's your shtick, branding yourself. And she knows about this stuff. She is a career coach. Uh, she is uh, a researcher very much into the, the way people do job search, both from the hiring and the searching perspective. So you, you'll want to come if you're available next week, April 1st. No fooling. We'll be here. Uh, Lynn Williams, what's your shtick? Branding yourself. And April 8th, the following week, Joey Himmelfarb will be back visualization and achieving your dreams. And he's always very motivational. So I'm glad that Joey will be able to join us as well.
And uh, if anyone who's interested, uh, April 9th, which is Saturday morning, The Breakfast Club of New Jersey will be presenting TheBreakfastClubNJ.com, TheBreakfastClubNJ.com. Uh, Glenn Posh will be pre presenting Beyond the Resume, Sharing Your Skills and Yourself. So you'll want to check out that website. And our cousin organizations, PSG of Central New Jersey meets every Monday morning at 10.30, unless it's a Monday holiday, then they meet on Tuesdays, psgcnj.biz, psgcnj.biz, and PSG of Morris County. And uh, our friend John Sampson is always very active in that group on Wednesday mornings at 9.30, psgmc.org, psgmc.org. So check out those groups for some more information. And so uh, until we hopefully get to see each other again real soon, either out and about in town or virtually online, I'll simply once again say thank you to Eileen and bye, everybody. Hello, thank you.